Uh, DeRosa and Sarah Badwi back with you. It's Breeders' Cup time. Sarah, we've been talking about it for a few weeks, but I do feel like the release of the pre-entries means the race is on for handicappers. It's finally go time. <laughs> it is. Uh, now, the, my style of handicapping, though, I really don't grid, to use my term, until the actual fields are set. I like having the program numbers. When I used to do it by pre-entry, I'd be writing names down, and I don't know. I, I just felt like I really wasn't saving that much time because then I was going back to the program numbers anyway. Um, so I, admittedly, I'll be starting in earnest, earnest, earnest in terms of like wagering ideas next week, but it's still fun to go through these fields and just kind of see who's who, who's coming from where, maybe some vulnerable favorites, things like that. Well, I think that's kind of part of the uh, difficulties and also um, excitement in a way of having to do all of this publicly is that once the information is released, we kind of need to be as ahead of the game as we possibly can. So glad that the pre-entries are out and that we get that opportunity to look at what these fields might consist of because next week before the actual Breeders' Cup events, we're both going to be crazy busy with finalizing both our personal wagers, our Horse Racing Nation content, all the great products that we have available and making sure that we have some opinions from some outside people as well. And maybe some head to head wagers between us. Oh, possibly because uh, the Keeneland meet is coming to an end for the fall and you have a deficit to make up. I do. Uh, I had one. I actually, I liked a price today that I picked and the horse ran about as bad as you could possibly run. I didn't even get a thrill. So we'll keep punching though. Uh, but certainly going to have, I would think between the two of us, some long shot looks here or there, hopefully connect on uh, really only need one of those at Breeders' Cup along with some other top opinions. Uh, I think we've kind of been through the classic enough. Uh, no real surprises with the pre-entries. At this point, I'm just kind of wondering how low flight line is going to go in the wagering. Uh, I was thinking like three to five two weeks ago, and then I was like, eh, maybe two to five, one to two. And now, I mean, as good as life is good as Epicenter Taba, all horses people might be interested in betting. It's realistic that flight line could be one to five in the classic. I definitely agree. Um, but, you know, I'm curious to see what kind of price he opens up at because I feel like there's still a lot of people that are trying to beat him um, and that are thinking that he's vulnerable in this spot. I think there's a lot of people that won't really have a clue as to what's going on as far as the general public that will be wagering on this race. Um, I, I'm very curious to see how the betting goes for the classic because I think that these races that are more in the public eye um, are bet very differently than those that are just on a regular Wednesday like today. I am going to try to pay some bills while giving some information. We have a lot of great information already available at mm -hmm. Horse Racing Nation. The link is scrolling there at the bottom. Super screener, of course, uh, race by race for the Breeders' Cup. But a lot of data included in our uh, Secrets to Playing the Breeders' Cup ebook that uh, we put together with Candice. Appreciate all her work on that. And one of the things I looked at was the prices recently at Breeders' Cup. Keeneland, 33% favorites, more than any other track except Churchill, which just had the one year, was 5 for 14, so 35%-ish. For whatever reason, the Kentucky Breeders' Cups, more favorites than the other places. Do you think that's a coincidence, or is there something to form holding here in the bluegrass? You know, I wonder if maybe it's that the East Coast horses don't have to ship. Because I feel as though, and you and I are both kind of obviously East Coast biased people, <laughs> when they have to go to ship to California, those are more horses that are being kind of taken out of their element. And when the Breeders' Cup events are hosted um, sort of on their turf, maybe that's not the case. Uh, that's just a guess. I don't have any data behind that, but that's just kind of the first thing that comes to mind about why that might be happening. All right. And uh, that product and so much more. Available for Breeders' Cup, $99, include Super Screener and a bunch of other information. So check that out. Uh, very proud of uh, all the information in there, including uh, some looks at the Track Trends tool, as well as some post data from the current Keeneland meet. 
And as a handicapper, and I asked uh, David Levitch this uh, when we dished earlier, but curious your thoughts as well. Breeders' Cup at Keeneland. We've had now three weeks of racing, about to have a fourth at Keeneland leading up to Breeders' Cup. Seen some trends, uh, especially sprinting on the dirt, but then we're going to have a week off. Is the is the slate wiped clean? That was hard to say. Is the slate wiped clean for you, or in your head are you thinking about how the track played this month? Um, with only a week in between, no. I would keep in mind how uh, the track has been playing so far this meet. If this was going from the fall to the spring, then yes, I'd say that you just start over. And you don't keep any of those trends necessarily um, as a bias that you would use going forward until you start seeing it again. But only a week, I would I would definitely keep in mind that the rail has not been good in those sprint races around one turn. Um, and that the rail has been more beneficial in those route races. Those are definitely things I would keep in mind going forward to the Breeders' Cup. Yeah, and we uh, one race in particular that is extremely susceptible to post is the Dirt Mile, and we'll show you just how susceptible if you buy the product. But needless to say, that is one race. <clears throat> I would say of all 14 Breeders' Cup races, that's the one that post has uh, the, the most impact. Yeah, that's a very uh, clearly biased situation. And I think that getting those actual post positions will make a, a big difference on where I'm leaning in that race in particular. Um, as far as the pre-entries that we saw come out today, I think the biggest um, piece of information that we were given is probably the Latruska's cutting back for the Philly and Mare Sprint. Any thoughts about that? Uh, you know, to me, I, I kind of like the confidence. Um, you know, they I think that shows they have a horse who's, not done yet, which some people, you know, may may argue with based on what we've seen in the last few. But it's interesting to me. Uh, at her best, her figures certainly are going to be as fast as anyone else in that race. Uh, you know, this isn't a year where we have sort of that superstar Philly and Mare Sprinter in my mind. Uh, and I did not see what preference Kamari had in terms of which sprint race, um, certainly her her presence in the Philly and Mare turf would be interesting. But Latruska is one of those, like, I never really liked her when she was getting bet heavily, even when she was winning everything. And now all of a sudden you're, you're getting a, a legitimate speed grade one horse cutting back who could be a price. Uh, so I'm interested. What did you think? I think it's the right move. And I think it shows that they're, her connections are really thinking about suit her best. And I think that she might not be the favorite. So that could be an intriguing uh, option if any of the shorter priced horses are drawing those inside posts, which we know have not done well at Keeneland so far this meet. Um, and I think the other piece of interesting information, at least for you, is that Moira is coming. I am very excited about that. Uh, not only Moira from Canada, but she's getting Frankie DeTori from Europe as her jockey. And, you know, I'm not one of these that, you know, thinks Frankie is light years ahead uh, of anyone. And, and at this point, Ryan Moore, I think sort of the fashionable choice is the best international jockey, but certainly Frankie world-class and nothing against Moore's previous pilot who did win the Queens plate honor. And, uh, you know, certainly has, has won his share of races, but that, that was so bad in the EP Taylor. It's just one of those where you, you're like, hey, mistakes happen, whatever. I, I, I wouldn't hold it against him in perpetuity, but completely understand these connections wanting to say, we have a chance in the Breeders' Cup. We're getting Frankie. No hard feelings. Right. That was definitely not an ideal ride last time. But I am absolutely, I mean, this is one of those, and We'll see what happens, but I, I, I mean, I'm going to look at the PPs because not like she'll be a stone cold single and I won't use anyone else under any circumstance, but she is absolutely my pick to win that race. I had a feeling she would be. And speaking of sprints on the male side, which we knew this, it wasn't a surprise with the pre-entries, but Jack Christopher, as I said in the car wash this morning, I love the move to the sprint. The point of the Breeders' Cup is to crown champions. It wasn't going to happen for him in the dirt mile. It can happen for him in the sprint. 
I don't think he's the most likely winner, but this is the move if you want to prove yourself a champion. I'm excited to see the Battle of the Jacks. <laughs> How often does that happen? Uh, maybe this is the first. Who knows? Although, did who was it last? Oh, it was Life is Good was in the Jerkins with Jackie's Warrior, right? Yes. Yep. And now Jack, yeah, the Battle of the Jacks. Now, how come Jack, I mean, I guess he's good enough and he get, he's favored anyway, but it doesn't seem like he gets bet like Happy Jack did. What do you mean, Jack Christopher not getting bet like Happy Jack? Well, I mean, he gets bet because he's, it doesn't seem like the Jacks bet Jack Christopher. Oh, well, maybe the Jacks bet Happy Jack because he's a long shot and they're like, well... That's the name. Uh, and also, he yeah. was in the Derby and more of the races that the public are watching. Jack Christopher hasn't really been in those races. Yet. Could be it. Well, I guess he can't be in the Derby anymore. But no. he will be in the Breeders' Cup sprint. Yes. Any other uh, thoughts? Friday, I, I haven't even begun to look at the internationals with the two-year-olds. To me, that's sort of the final frontier because you never really know who's going to show up. But I, I do think... After flight line, Cave Rock to me is the most likely winner. I'm curious to look at the rest of the field for that. Um, I think the main defection being Loggins for Brad Cox, who was uh, a little bit of an unlucky runner up last time out in the Breeders Futurity at Keeneland. Um, he just has such a sprinter's pedigree that even though he might be able to get this distance and he ha certainly has a speed edge and the numbers are just much better than what we've seen from the other two-year-olds, I don't know what this means for him going forwards as far as if he'll want to stretch out and if he would be a legitimate Kentucky Derby horse contender. Um, but you can't ignore what he's done so far and it's been very impressive. So uh, I think that I, I would want to agree with that but I am a little bit curious about the distance for him. Sure. I do think, uh, <clears throat> depending on the draw, the mile and the 16th should be in his benefit, not the distance. I mean, the mile and the 16th at Keeneland with the short stretch and you can just kind of take control of the race. And bad example from 2015, because those two were classic types. Nyquist went on to win the Derby. Songbird, of course, was a grade one winner at three and four herself routing. Um, so they're, they're not the cave rock profile, but still the, that two year old just kind of stretching out. Um, it, it just, I think, benefits that running style that those two had. Cave rock has similar. Really, the aberration, I would say, would be a central quality from 2020. Uh, you know, it looked like that was Jackie's Warriors race to win with. And essential quality was just kind of the, the better horse, is it? But uh, yeah, the, to me, the Cave Rock much better suited this being at Keeneland than say, I mean, he already did it at Santa Anita, but that's home. Uh, Churchill might have been an issue. Makes sense for sure. Well, my main focus right now is honestly on all the content we have coming up for next week. And I'm doing all of my scheduling today with all of the great guest handicappers that we're going to have. And let me tell you, trying to find 14 people that I want to talk to about different races and scheduling them all for two days is um, a task, but I'm about a third of the way done. So Excellent. we have a lot coming next week. A lot of uh, good stuff coming next week and depending on when you're watching this on pre-entry day, Wednesday might already be here. Picks.horseracingnation.com, the place for that. Like and subscribe to get everything that we'll be pushing out on this channel. And I thought I had one last breeder. Oh, the wagering menu. Uh, got the $3 pick three on Friday and all turf pick four on Saturday. Some added pick fives. I know your style. You're much less gonzo than I am I'm in every pool. You're judicious and pick your spots. Base, mm -hmm. Have you looked at the race order yet? Have, have you kind of thought like, oh, man, this is where I actually have some opinions to string together or not there yet? Not there yet. I will divulge into something that's kind of unrelated, but that I think is really cool. Um, I want to, since this is the first Breeders' Cup that I'll be attending, I want to get a $2 win wager ticket on every horse in the Breeders' Cup Classic and then also a photo of them before the race. And I'm going to make a little art project with that. Oh. So not really worth anybody's actual wagering money, but I think that'll no, be really cool to have. 
I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out. And you only got nine pre-entered, probably seven or eight in the gate. So it shouldn't be too expensive either. I think it'll be worth my $2 for each horse. <laughs> and depending on how many impressions you get, maybe even let you expense the win tickets. <laughs> or at least we could Chipotle. Possibly... Oh, okay. Well, maybe I'll get an extra copy for the HRN office to go above the Arlington uh, piece that we have of how the, what is it? Is it how the track was composed? Yeah, the, the, the poly track. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. I like it. So got that to look forward to. That's actually literally the last thing because it's the last race of Breeders' Cup. Mm -hmm. But between now and then, lots of great information, plenty of good videos, chatter on Twitter. Go to picks.horseracingnation.com for all the stuff that we're talking about. And I guess we'll see people on Monday. Well. You'll see them for Outrun the Odds. Yes. Well, they'll see me. I don't really they'll see, see that. They'll see you. Yes, they'll see you. <laughs> and then we'll chat with them. We're going to go live on Monday during the uh, the post draw. That's at Rupp Arena. We'll be here in the office or at least in Jefferson County if uh, – depending on where our locations are. But we will be doing it live. Breeders' Cup Draw Monday. Like and subscribe. Notifications on. You'll hear all about it. Sarah, enjoy the week. You too. Good luck, everybody.